I knew I always wanted to be a surgeon, wanted to be a doctor. There was no such thing as cardiac surgery when I qualified as a doctor. I qualified as a doctor in South Africa and then came over to this country on a scholarship to study surgery. Mr. Ross, most would agree that you were the first surgeon to implant an aortic homograph valve, and I wonder if you could tell us about that operation. I was a fledgling uh, cardiac surgeon those days and doing a lot of closed heart surgery, you know, opening valves with your finger and with instruments and so on. But we didn't have, there wasn't such a thing as a valve replacement. We were opening valves. And uh, I became increasingly ambitious, as young people are, and uh, dissected or dilated a rigidly calcified valve with the result is that the whole thing disintegrated and went down the sucker so that we were left with a gaping hole and no valve. We remembered that we had stored some human valves in frozen in ice many years before when I was doing research work. So we reconstituted one of these valves in a hurry and sewed it in the gaping hole, thinking, well, it'll, it'll, hopefully it'll keep the patient alive until we get one of these new magical mechanical valves. The answer is that the biological or human valve worked perfectly from the start and we forgot about mechanical valves from that time on. I think the hermograft, of course, was the big concept in the first days. Then I think there was also the, uh, the switch operation for transposition. It was, I think he did one of the earliest in this country here. Mm -hmm. uh, of course, the first transplant in this country, but they again were done under very primitive conditions. We literally moved a patient from the operating table onto a bed which was banged up by the operating table. And on bed blocks, one ambu bag, a bird ventilator. And uh, that's how we started. How did you accomplish those complex operations without without modern methods? By, uh, yes, by coronary perfusion. In other words, we t from the heart-lung machine, we took a, a source of blood and divided into two catheters, put one, put one down each coronary artery. In other words, perfused the coronaries with blood throughout the operation. It was a, an added complication. Was the heart easier then, these days. Was the heart then beating uh, during the operation? It was beating, yes. Once we'd established the left-hand side uh, homograft, we turned our thoughts to other problems, and the other problems, of course, had been on the right side for many years. Congenital heart disease involves often the outflow tract of the right side of the heart, like the blue babies and fallows tetralogy, often obstruction of the outflow of the right ventricle. And so there have been various techniques to try and relieve that. My previous chief, Lord Brock, of course, developed instruments to open up the outside, rather crudely punching it out, cutting it, and so on. And well, but it was very effective at the time, but it was rather dangerous and traumatic. And so it seemed to us that now that we had this human valve available, why not put that in the right side of the heart, cut out all the obstruction and problems, and so in this human valve, this aortic homograph valve. And that worked very well. We changed from aortic valves, aortic homographs, to pulmonary homographs, it's more logical if you're going to replace the right side with the right-sided homograph. So we used pulmonary homographs in 1966. But most of the Ross procedures were actually done in this clinic, is that correct? Yeah, eventually. Nearly all of them, yes. How many Ross procedures do you think you did? I did 420-something. Is that right? Yeah. And this was your favorite operating room? Yes. I suppose basically those two, but uh, yes, it makes me feel very nostalgic. Yes. 
It gave me everything I wanted. So what's the longest Ross survivor, Ross procedure survivor? Ver oh, 33 years, I think, was a functional bowel. Mm -hmm. First one died at the age, uh, 30 years afterwards with cancer of the prostate. But not bowel. But the bowel right? was perfect. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. And have those, did those patients require um, reoperations for the homograft on the very right few, side? Very few, very uh, few. About in 20 years, 10%, I think. And from there, one watched the many advances that he personally pioneered and worked out. Uh, first uh, was uh, the homograph for congenital heart disease in the right ventricular outflow tract quickly followed, 1966 I think, uh, quickly followed the aortic homograph it was in the aortic position and then um, came the pulmonary autograft which I thought was an extremely attractive operation. When I started uh, I was, whenever I could, um, I was coming and learn from his wisdom because obviously he is a true pioneer. Well, let me ask you a question that, that I've been asked yeah. multiple times concerning the Ross procedure. Yeah. And it is, why in the world would you even consider taking a person with single valve heart disease mm. and making them a patient with double valve disease. Well, that was the original sort of I'm uh, sure. criticism. They used to talk about 200, I'd invented a 200% mortality operation. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, well, after all, you can live with a bad pulmonary valve, but you can't live with a bad aortic valve. It was, uh, you know, it met with a lot of scorn and derision and uh, misbelief to begin with. After we published it 20 years afterwards, <laughs> after the initial one, the world was ready to accept it. Uh, a lot of people just didn't think that he would do it. And I must admit, uh, with some shame, that uh, we took a long, long time to embark on the bandwagon, which I regret now. It's got a very acceptable mortality, in fact, very acceptable mortality, no, no more risky than any other aortic operation in the world. There was enormous competition from the mechanical valve people, which still persists, and they have the money. We didn't have any money, we were just uh, relying on the reputation of the valve, whereas the mechanical valve people have pushed it very strongly and still do. Most important thing about the valve in relation to children is that it grows with the child. This is totally unique. There's no other valve in the world which will grow with the patient. I think for this single operation, I think he deserves um, all the credit. He did inspire great loyalty, particularly in his staff, and which he repaid. And uh, also his uh, quietness and his ability to explain complex uh, concepts in simple terms and uh, to inspire. He has an extremely good logical mind, very intelligent, very observant, and he can work out what should be and then he can carry it out because his head is attached to his hands. It's not something I can say about every cardiac surgeon. If you had one piece of advice to give a young cardiac surgeon, uh, what would that be? Have any thoughts? Find yourself a good teacher <laughs> and apprentice yourself to him. I think that's that's been my advantage, that I was attached to this gentleman, Lord Brock, for five years, seven years. We were associated for another probably up to ten years. The current six months at a time from one surgeon to another, you can't, it's not fair on the surgeon or on yourself to, he's, to try and pick up his knowledge and techniques. The 
between the time that uh, the first pulmonary autograph procedure was performed in, in 1967 and 20 years later, did you ever think that, that the world was just going to go uh, uh, blindly by in, in ignorance of uh, what was a, a very valuable uh, therapeutic option? Probably, probably had bitter thoughts. <laughs> But, you know, I, there's a little cartoon I've shown about myself wandering in the wilderness. Why won't somebody come and help me? <laughs> but uh, it, it all worked out eventually, but it took 20 years of wilderness uh, exploration.